Well, Reverend Ladi Thompson joins us now. He's a strategic security consultant. He joins us from our studios in Abuja. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Well, since the last time you were here and so many um, very, very serious issues that you raised, would you say we're on track in addressing the national security challenges? Well, let me just uh, say that from a lot of comments and what is coming from the government right now, I think there has been a reality check and that I do hope that right now, because of that reality check, the government is prepared now to provide the kind of leadership we need for this uh, final push for us to get a stable, peaceful nation. Uh, by that, I mean the fact that we have transited to the final phase, I believe, of this uh, war against terror. And um, looking at it from a very positive side, there are dark clouds, okay. There's a lot of bloodshed still going on. There's a lot of kidnappings and all that. But if we look beyond it, we begin to catch glimpses of a new nation, a major nation, a peaceful nation. So my prayer is that um, we get this phase, this final phase, my prayer is that we get it right. If we do, the nation is going to have peace. For this final phase, I must tell you that I've given it thought. The policy I believe that must be upheld above all by government is a policy that realizes that the best way to tackle insecurity at this time now is to grow security. We have to grow security. We have been on a learning curve for a long time, and at this phase right now, it would be inexcusable for us to say that uh, the government has not learned what we are up against and what to do. Let me put it like this, a practical example. All over the country right now, everybody is looking for something. And I think the easiest way to emphasize it is to have the federal government and the leadership of Nigeria realize that from the almajiri to the mechanic to the medical doctor and the nurse, when everybody goes to a mango tree, they are not interested in how green the leaves are. Nobody wants to understand the back, how strong the trunk of the tree is or how powerful its roots are. From the almajiri to the mechanic to the doctor, the nurse and everybody, They've gone to the mango tree to look for mango fruit. There is a fruit Nigerians are looking for, and that fruit is the total solution to this insecurity. And that fruit is the growing of security, uh, like I have mentioned. Uh, this time, I believe that the government has now seen, um, from all the, government, all the comments coming and the changes being made, that the solution to this problem the military aspect of it, we're talking about asymmetrical warfare, hybrid threats and all that, and force multipliers, at best is only 30-something percent. And let me tidy it up by saying this, is that I believe that the government has come to a point where they realize that if we're going to win this thing right now, it's no longer just about personnel, men, and equipment. We have to ideate the nation. We have to supply the other three things that I have mentioned that every other nation has when they are tackling security. Beyond this time, if those other three things are not put into place, honestly, uh, a lot of people around this country will be very displeased and we will never understand why they have not been put into place. Well, uh, Reverend, first of all, let me ask you about growing security. We'll come to those three things, but what do you mean when you say we need to grow security? It's as simple as trying to explain to a person that you don't fight darkness by pushing darkness out. You fight darkness by introducing something. You introduce light. So if we're going to grow the peace in this country, this is the key word. We're going to have to ideate the country. To grow the peace in this country, we're going to have to accept that there must be a change from the concept of leadership that operated in the older times to a new concept of leadership 
that can produce all that we need to terminate this problem finally. And uh, it is all here now. It's all become, you know, uh, a game of the mind, so to speak. To build the peace, I mean, you've heard this over and over. People are talking about including, getting the public involved and all that. These are things we've been saying for years, but we've been slow to learn that this war can never be won only by the military. To grow the peace, we need to get the entire country involved. To get the entire country involved, we need to introduce a, a national ideology that gives every Nigerian citizen a place of pride, a place where he has a stake in making sure that Nigeria stays as one, among other things. So that's what I mean by growing the peace. Well, there are many other issues to take with you, uh, Reverend Thompson, but we have to take all of that when we return from the break. And, and talk about engaging people. The question is how, after this break. Please stay with us. Just, they could just effect the arrest simply like that because of he has made a lot of noise and has a large followership and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a healthy, very healthy development for me as a person. Thanks for staying with us. Uh, Reverend Thompson, uh, let's begin with what you just uh, saw and heard. How significant do you see um, the arrest of uh, Namdi Kano in our fight against all forms of insecurity in the country? I think it's um, an integral part of the whole. Because you see, when I said that we need to ideate the country. The, the gap and the vacuum that uh, the opportunistic uh, streak in, in Nam Dikan was able to capitalize on was because Nigeria today is yet to realize that if we are going to be a part of the global community and to cooperate properly, we are going to move away from the leadership of men to leadership by ideas. You see, once Nigeria refuses to supply the idea, that's why I said we need to idea it. We need to provide ourselves a, a, a national narrative that, a, that gives value to the life of every citizen in such a way that everybody is bonded together. As long as that vacuum continues, first of all, the security situation will never be resolved. We need to supply a value system we need to supply also an architecture of thought. We need to think 30 steps ahead of the threats against the country. Now, to Nam Dekano, we have to proceed with caution. It's a good thing that he has been arrested by the federal government. But moving forward, I mean, we need to com commend the security services for having done that. But however, moving forward, if you heard the tonality of caution with which most commentators have spoken, we would want the federal government to realize that putting Ndam Dikan on trial is a part of a whole picture. First of all, I would like to tell you something, that there's a difference between the concept of Biafra, the dream of Biafra, the event of Biafra, the war of Biafra, the trauma of Biafra, and then the opportunists like Nam Dekanu, who have taken advantage of the fact that all these other things we mentioned have never been given closure. And because they have not been given closure, the average Igbo youth, just like the average Nigerian youth in any other part of this country, wakes up in the morning and does not see a future. He does not see a future because it is the duty of the government to provide him a vision. Now, in the absence of a vision, you will find out that people instinctively, when they become traumatized, they see terror, 
left, right, and center, they don't see a future. Instinctively, people begin to look for the future in the past. And that's why you are finding out that the clamor for Biafra, the clamor for Dudua Republic, and all those irredentist calls and, you know, separatist calls, were getting stronger and louder and finding place in the hearts of men. Now, in proceeding forward, we need to be very careful because when the government puts Unam Nekano on trial, you want to make sure that it is his opportunism that is put on trial. Now, if he is wily and crafty, he's going to want to mix all the issues together. If the federal government ever makes a mistake, a strategic mistake, of allowing the concept of Biafra, the event of Biafra, the Biafran war, the trauma of Biafra, and all these other issues that have not received closure. If we ever make the mistake of allowing all those things to come to this trial, the outcome will not help the country. But I believe that there's more than enough wisdom in the leadership of this country. I, I must say something that I want all of us to realize right now. We need to rise above petty politics of the day to realize that the challenges facing Nigeria today are twofold. One, we have the threat, the global threat of terrorism that has its local face. Now, it has come to meet ancient problems that we are never, ever resolved. We're talking about the cleavages, divisions, talking about corruption, talking about uh, religious uh, intolerance, and other things that had always been on ground, but were never addressed convincingly. So the complication now is this opportunistic uh, attempt by Nnam Dekanu to hijack the hearts of the young people, and he had some degree of success. Nobody listening to his rhetoric, nobody who has listened to his approach would say that this is kind of the future you want for any Igbo man or anybody at all. But the point is, like you mentioned earlier, there are, there's no vacuum. Nature abhors vacuum. There's no vacuum in life. So except we supply an overarching vision for the nation that bonds all of, of us together, that gives value to the lives of our citizens and gives us an assurance of a tomorrow, you will find out that opportunities like this will always continue to do well. So we have to be very careful. There are many young people who, in the absence of that vision, the ideating that I spoke about, in the absence of that, they have latched on to his demagoguery and his opportunism. Now, the, we're going to have to, as his elders in the country, will always continue to advise the, 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 the government. Go about this very clinically. Separate the issues. Show clearly that this is an opportunist who was about to lead a whole section of the country in a totally negative direction. And I don't think that is something that's too difficult to do. Well, uh, is that, in your opinion, why the other three, uh, three main um, uh, ethnic uh, groups in the country, the Ohaneze, the Afeniferi, the ACF, also caution the government to be uh, careful in this prosecution? Uh, precisely. They are saying that because there's been a grand swell of calls for separatism. And I've said to you that the only reason that is happening is because we have refused to supply the nation with a single vision that is profitable to all. Let me now, tell you this. In the design of nations, there are two basic things that leadership must always take note of. It is the anticipation of pleasure and the fear or dread of pain. In creating any nation, you must toggle these things. Now, this is the point. If the average person looks and the future is bleak, and what is prevalent, the news coming to him on a daily basis, is the anticipation of pain, rather than looking forward to the pleasure of fulfillment, of prosperity, of progress, and things like that. 
Now, don't forget that the anticipation of pleasure is more powerful than pleasure. And let's not forget again that the dread of pain is even more powerful than the pain itself. So these are the tools. The terrorists have been using the dread of pain to try and shape the destiny of Nigeria. Now, it is up to Nigerian leadership, like I said, to realize that it's not just a, num a game of numbers or oh, I have this number of men behind me anymore. What leads in the world today is the leaders of ideas. So there must be a fresh vision that assures the, uh, the, 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 the constituencies controlled by Ohaneze, controlled by uh, Feni Ferry and uh, all other groups like that. There has to be something supplied from the center. And mark me, because I've t told you that this is one of the things that is still missing that we're expecting to be put firmly and established firmly in the days ahead. But if it is not done, then we will understand that the affairs are truly justified. In talking about um, vision, and a national vision, a, a number of people have spoken um, in that vein as well. I remember uh, Professor, uh, uh, I've forgotten his name right now, also mentioned the need for us to have uh, a national ethos. However, in the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Section 15 is clear. The motto of the Federal Republic of Nigeria shall be unity and faith, peace and progress. Sub 2 of that section says, national integration shall be highly, beg your pardon, actively encouraged while discrimination against while discrimination on the grounds of place of origin, sex, religion, status, ethnicity, or linguistic association or ties shall be prohibited. Is it a problem of coinage or a, prob or a problem of ideating, just as you said earlier? I think it's a problem of having a reality check. You see, first of all, the Nigerian constitution uh, contains a lot of words. And those words, frankly speaking, may not be worth what we think it is until those words have been injected into the hearts of men, our citizens. Now, don't forget that we are coming from a background of trauma. We are coming from a background of slavery, and then we morphed into colonialism. And the earlier statesmen who helped us to get our liberation in this country, they were very clear in helping us to realize that the edifice that we call Nigeria initially was totally a British idea. And they admitted, if you listen to one of the comments of our statesmen in, in 1968, they all admitted that at independence it was handed over to us. However, the comment went on to say that what was handed over to us at independence had within it the forces of its own disintegration, forces to disintegrate the nation. And three things were prescribed by these statesmen. They said we had to tackle those forces of disintegration efficiently and quickly. Then they asked us to define the Nigerian inheritance and preserve it before talking about making sure that life is peaceful, prosperous, and forward-looking for every single Nigerian individual. You see, the way we have been going about this is as if to say that a, a statesman like uh, Sir Abaka Tafar Balewa did not know what he was saying on the 7th of uh, October in 1960. The speech he gave at the United Nations till tomorrow, I think, is his most inspiring speech. In the closing paragraph, he acknowledged what he called intractable problems. He said this publicly. And then he mentioned the fact that there's something called eternal truths, that when Nigeria will be ready to halt all the infighting, the breakages, the cleavages, the faults, and all the things that we inherited, that we would be able to fall back on eternal truths. Now, don't forget the Willings Commission 1958 report. 
on moment, all Reverend. All the things you see playing just, out, divisions just, in Nigeria. Just on moment, you Reverend. The, the, and I, I don't want to lose uh, track of that critical thing that you mentioned uh, that at the that at the independence were uh, things that could divide the country, uh, even from as far back as then. What are those things, if you can identify them? Well, quick, quickly, they were just simply fruit. Just go and read uh, Lugard's. Actually, it was designed by Tom Mangoldi before the British government took over uh, the territories of the Royal Niger uh, Company. And then they brought in Lugard, the Megard, uh, Lord, sorry, <laughs> Lord Lugard, to come and supervise, you know, the amalgamation of Nigeria and the putting together of Nigeria. Now, if you go and read his dual mandate, you'll find out there that the, the, there's a policy called divide and rule. That divide and rule policy is to create something that will keep failing without falling. As long as the colonial uh, puppet master is somewhere in the background pulling the strings. Now, it is not just a Nigerian thing. Practically, most of the nations of Africa were all designed like that. It's just that it has taken us quite some time to understand those forces of divide and rule and how they work. So that when we understand those things, I mean, they're called algorithms. I can tell you some of the things that we need to do for us to get rid of, you know, the effects of the divide and rule. But the point is that um, through the years, unfortunately, what this government has inherited is the fact that through the years, no leadership has ever convincingly been able to span the divide and rule. And more so because corruption was increasing. The monster of corruption was also growing side by side naturally. Now, the engineers of the Nigerian system knew all this. They could look a hundred years ahead and tell you that, look, this is what's going to happen by so, so and so, based on what we have designed into your system. So the divide and rule is the key word here that we have to neutralize. The question then is how? <laughs> Let me put it like this. A lot of the solution to Nigeria's challenges today, talking about the ancient solutions now, not the external aggression of terrorism. A lot of this, the, the solutions, what we are looking for is in the archives of the colonial office in our metropole, uh, former metropole nation in, uh, in, in the UK. Now, some of them have been declassified. Uh, I sent a team to the UK some years ago. And when they brought me the documents and I looked through it, I couldn't but admire the brilliance of men like Lord Chandos, uh, Lewis Harcourt, and all the people who sort of put, helped to put, uh, you know, the colonial contraption together. You couldn't but help to admire the fact that these people think deeply, even in creating a problem. Now, the advantage we have is that these are days of artificial intelligence, deep learning. These are days when you put all this data into a computer, it can go over spans of 600 years and all that, and help you to locate what we can call the solution algorithms. Now, let us look at uh, Nigeria. Nigeria was, the divide and rule was applied in Nigeria in two tranches. Very clever. First of all, there was a northern divide from the southern divide. Now, the animosity was engineered in such a way, now for you to know how deliberate this was, go and listen to um, an interview that was granted by Ernest Ecoli, who of course you know died in you know, 1960. Ernest Ecoli, one of our earliest uh, uh, statesmen. Ernest Ecoli said, when the colonial officers from Britain were coming into Nigeria, the colonial officers going to Northern Nigeria and the colonial officers coming to Southern Nigeria were always at loggerheads they were even conditioned and programmed to fight each other on Elder Dempster, on the ship, on the way to Nigeria. They considered themselves enemies. Now, if the colonial administrators considered themselves enemies, how much more the cleave between the North and the South? Now, don't forget that these people were so clever that it took only 399, practically, colonials to rule over 7 million seven million people in northern Nigeria in those days. 
It, that was in early 1900s. So trust me, we are not dealing with something that you can solve without thinking. So the one, I will just tell you that the what we call solution alg algorithms are available. Um, Nigeria likes fire brigade, you know, this fire brigade thing is never going to work. So, but for now, we are short of time, so I will mention one of them. Nigeria has been crafted in such a way that if you look at our predictable history, we can't even discuss without fighting. The traumatic events of our past are so emotional. And this, of course, of course affects the issue of Biafra now. Now, let me say this to you. One of the first things Nigeria had better do, which we're looking to leadership to do, and honestly, non-state actors, we have begun to make our moves because we are looking ahead as well. All of us are concerned in the future of our children and our grandchildren. The first thing we need to put into place is called non-violent communication. There's a platform of communication that is not strange to Africa. It's called non-violent communication. It has been well developed in many parts of the world. And I'm going to tell you something. Except we establish the platform of non-violent communication, the animosities, the effects of the divide and rule, the gaps between us will never be spanned. But if we apply non-violent communication, and insist that it must be the national platform for all discourse, you will find out that what it does for us is that it separates substance from smoke. So having done that, we are able to locate the real issues. Then we can put the Biafran war, we can give it proper closure. The events of Biafra can receive closure. Listen to me, the concept of Biafra will never die because thoughts that have been well articulated will never die. But what wisdom does to things like that is that you deconstruct it. You granulate them. Sometimes you remove the venom from them by separating issues and making it simple for the average citizen to consume. So this non-violent communication between North and South is important. Also, even between southern nations. Now, let me say to you, everybody's calling for uh, Odua Republic, everybody's calling for uh, uh, Biafran this and that and that and that, not realizing that the enemy of the country is the one that played the chess moves to make people look for the future in the past, believing that we cannot ideate, we cannot bring fresh ideas to handle and give our children and our grandchildren the, the, the future that they deserve. So the, the point now is, if we're able to, first of all, quickly establish nonviolence, the southern uh, uh, part of the country can bridge all its gaps quickly. There'll be no need to talk about looking for the future in the past. Now, because Nigeria was divided in two steps, we also have to reconstruct this in two steps. Now, the same people who set out the problem have also given us a formula to pretend as if we are really united in the country. So to be politically correct, before you can even apply the solution, you have to be very courageous. It will take separate total unification of the North, total proper unification of the South, before we can now come from for a practical unification profitable of both North and South. Then and only then can we talk about an overarching vision that the whole of Nigeria will believe in. A central... We can always try any other course, but I can assure you that the future will bear me witness. I, I, that I, I, there's a wisdom that is better than weapons of war. I, 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 I think, you know, when you talk about communication, a uh, good number of people will agree that that's a critical major problem, um, uh, you know, in the whole melee, because just as you mentioned, it will seem like we don't jaw jaw until we war war. Question then is, why does it have to be like that? But you know what? Um, let's take one minute uh, to uh, uh, to explore a thing or two. Take take one message, and we'll, then we'll be right back with you to talk about engaging the younger uh, population of Nigeria. Do stay with us. Thanks for staying with us, uh, Reverend Thompson. In another 10 years, the 18-year-old is going to be 28. I talked about that earlier.
And you say that there are very interested Nigerians are also looking forward. So let's look forward 10 years. The largest population in Nigeria today are young people. And from all that, all that you have said, it will seem like they don't even have a clue what we are dealing with. How do we begin to communicate with them to bring them on board? Well, first of all, we will never be able to do that until our leadership totally and practically moves away from the leadership of men in terms of numbers and transits and takes an upper step to the leadership of thoughts. Now, whether we like it or not, because the global community has shrunk, that younger generation, we may be complaining about them, that uh, they're doing drugs, they're doing that and all that and all that, but the truth is, this nation never really made any provision for them. And because of the problems that this nation is facing, this nation is yet to make any provision for them. So in, uh, in a nutshell, we are sitting on a time bomb. Yet, this is not something that is very difficult to sort out. If we realize that a lot of the ideas of people in leadership positions, I didn't say all, I, I said a lot of, and I mean, right, let's move about politics right now. A lot of people are still thinking in the past. Those youths that you're talking about hold the key to the Nigerian future. Now, I want to take an example from the Southwest, because, you know, in the Southwest, we have this parable that says, you don't look at a matter from only one side, that if you do that, you are like a knife. It's only a knife that has only one side. But a cutlass or a sword has two sides. And at least minimum, we look at things from two different sides. And that you can imagine a man who wants to cross a road who looks only on one side of the road and doesn't look at the other side is not likely to last long. So let us look at things from the side of the younger generation. Number one, a 30-something-year-old man in Nigeria is considered to be a child because there's been very little provision for them. But amongst them, you will realize that they have realized that the future of the globe is on the digital platform. So, you see, we have a digital divide in Nigeria. The anachronisms, uh, the anachronistic uh, generation are still looking back and thinking that these are the days of typewriters. But there's a younger generation that has the advantage of the processing speed hmm. and, well, dig and the, the, the wide latitude of digital competition. Hmm. But Reverend, if we only would listen to the younger generation, we would find out that most of the solutions to the Nigerian problem are actually in the hands of the younger generation. Everything from smart houses, designing houses that run on solar energy, primarily in a place like Africa, it has taken us this long. Mm. All these things are common play in the hands of this younger generation. Well, Reverend, you know, it, so it's interesting it, that it, it, it's interesting that you that you raise it this way. And I'm just hoping that with all of the conversations that the federal government has um, advised that state government governments should engage, let's hope that they will actually create those platforms that will engage this young generation. We are completely out of time right now. We have to so thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. And it's been quite. Uh, strategic lecture in security, if I can put it that way. Reverend Laddie Thompson is a strategic security consultant. Thank you so much for your time and your thoughts this morning. Pleasure is always mine.